you've been coaching since 1999 and obviously the game's evolved a ton since then as far as coaching goes like has, has your style changed you know your approach to the game changed much or i mean you've always been a very detail oriented guy going back to when i you know played for you but uh, obviously analytics have been changed yeah. philosophy around coaching changed uh, you know, I think I continue to evolve, Riles. I, I like to think I'm a good student of the game. I, I think when you, Derek knows me really well as a player, you know me as a coach. Derek knows me as a coach and a player. I mean, I, I'm a very disciplined, structured thinker. Right. So to me, there's certain parts of the game, there's black and white. There's no gray. And I think in the early part of my coaching, that might have um, held me back a little bit just because, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine not doing it this way. And then you have these creative guys um, that do it differently but are still great players. And I can never forget Ken Hitchcock told me when I first started coaching, he said, you're going to have trouble with this at first. I go, what do you mean? He said, well, you're a, a motivated, self-motivated guy and you're a structured guy. And when a coach tells you to do something, you do it. And now you're going to be telling people to do something and they're not going to do it. And you might have a tough time with that at first. And it was really good advice because he was right. Mm. So like, if a coach told me to run two miles, I ran three. Like, yeah, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. I told you to bump a guy on a face off, then make sure you're ready to go. Right. And so when you're missing assignments to me that are black and white, I think I was really stubborn. And so I had a great experience in Philly. And then I got to work with Dean Lombardi in LA and he really challenged me on that. He said, you got to be a little more open-minded. You can, And so what I learned from that is you just got to be quiet and listen sometimes. And if there's a better way, then I'd like to hear it, but I want to know why and I want to know how to teach it. And I think I've really uh, been a lot more open to that. Uh, the part that hasn't changed for me is that I think if you're going to coach people, um, you have to establish relationships of trust. And I always felt with the Phantoms, you know, it didn't matter if it was your fourth line guy, which Riley was, no disrespect. Uh, if it was your first line guy, if Mike Richards or RJ Amberger or Patrick Sharp, I felt that everybody had a chance. Guys that you thought were going to make it wouldn't, and guys that you thought wouldn't make it would. And I thought everybody deserved a chance. So in order to do that, I thought relationships with your players is really important. So when you push them, they understood that you cared about them. Uh, I think the best players want to be pushed. You know, people always ask, what's it like coaching guys that are making uh, huge money? I said, well, to be honest with you, it's no different. The, the best players want to be pushed. You know, I had Kopitar and Dowdy in L.A. I had Mike Richards and Jeff Carter here. Uh, those guys all want to be pushed. They want direction. They, they, they want to be held accountable. They, they want to become the best at their trade so they can help the team uh, have success so you know I, I think today's player has changed we didn't have cell phones we didn't have social media yeah, that's true. you know I, you know you used to be able to call a guy and he answered the phone now you call a player and he says my voicemail is full Can't <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. so voicemail is obsolete so now i've had to learn how to text so i'll text you and say when can i get a hold of you when are you available and you know so that stuff works there I, uh, i'm not a big social media guy but the players are yeah and you know certainly the fans are i think it's helped grow the game so i think you've had to adapt with that stuff rouse and the analytics to me is just more information. Yeah. I, I think as coaches, um, you can't ignore it because it's not going away. But to me, that information has to help the players and it has to help them now. And it has to help the coaches point in a direction. I think the analytics should support decisions and not make decisions. Right. And yeah, Daryl Sutter, I, like I work with in LA, was great with that stuff. Like he, We get information. He said, okay, his first question was how are we helping the players? So if I threw all this information at the players, they didn't care. You know, we used to rate the players in L.A., and then I give a sheet and a guy like Drew Doughty, and we give them all this information back. And he would look through all, you know, your expected goals for, your expected goals against, chances for, chances against. The only stat he cared about was his rating. He All he cared about was what the coaches thought of his play. And this guy's one of the, he's one of the best defensemen I've had yeah. in my time in the National Hockey League and uh, best defender I've ever coached. Uh, but he is a free thinker, and I had to meet him somewhere in the middle with my structure and his freedom. So we made a deal. I'll give you freedom with discipline. I'll give you the freedom to play, but you got to have the discipline to play within the system of the, of the structure of the team. So, And, again, at the end of the day, I think good players want that. Right. Good players want to be pushed. Uh, I know they're going to find that out with Torch coming here. I know you guys were talking about that the other day, but I, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of respect there. and. I, uh, the players become better at what they're doing, and that's ultimately what they want so they can help the team have the most success they can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the one thing I remember, and you kind of touched on it, is the, the communication part. Like, like players want to be communicated to. They want to hear what you have to say so they can maybe fire back and sh you know, share their opinion because that goes a long way. And, and another thing, too, is like you know, going back to like 04, 05, like you knew all the guys' wives' names and girlfriends' names, which is like a, a big a big yeah. piece of like knowing your players because that 
builds that that trust and that confidence for that two way yeah, street. Yeah, that's really important, Riles. That's a great point. I think the one thing about the pandemic that hurt us is that like we didn't we weren't able to get together with the team and we were having functions with the families there and so I mean I I remember when I took the flyers over I I it was uh Darian Hatcher, who I had a ton of respect for, he was partnered with Freddie Meyer, and I asked Freddie Meyer if he knew Hatch's kids' names, and he didn't. And I'm like, well, how can you not know their names? Like, if you have my partner, I'd have you over for dinner three days a week. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. And but it's it's no disrespect to what was going on. I just think a team that knows each other at that level is going to play harder for each other when it translates on the ice. So I always felt you know the team that loves each other is going to play hard for each other. And it sounds corny, but it's true. Yeah, I mean, it's totally it's, it's a tough grind. You're in a really hostile environment when you step over the boards, and there's got to be an element of trust and care for each other that's going to translate into success. I've always felt that. And, um, you know, those relationships are important. And the communication is probably the biggest thing that's changed. And I think one of those things that has helped me the most is having two boys that play the game. I see what feedback or lack of feedback does to them. Yep. And I always tell this story, and I'll share it with you quickly. We were playing on the island when I was with the Kings, and we uh, played in Long Island that losing game in overtime. And Alec Martinez had a great game and was one of the best players on the ice. But he had this brutal turnover in overtime that end up costing us the game. And if you know Alec Martinez, he's just beating himself up. So I'm on the plane, we're heading out, and I'm sitting, I'm going to watch the game. I said, I'll talk to him tomorrow. And I all of a sudden, I'm thinking about my two kids, John and Nolan. They'd be beating themselves up there. So I slammed my computer shut. I walked in the back of the plane. Marty's there, and he's like, what? And I go, move over. <laughs> so, so, so I said, listen, you know, you had a hell of a game tonight. You know, if, if we take that last play out, that ended up costing us a game. You're probably one of the best players on the ice. I know, I know. I said, well, listen park it and move on don't do it again <laughs> yeah and he and you know but he just looked at me and said all right well if i hadn't have gone back and talked to him he wouldn't have slept that night right because right. he's beating himself up because he cares and i thought you know let's deal with it now rather than late, wait till later because that's going to help him move on and get ready for the next game so it, it's a good lesson for us as coaches you know when you're dealing with people and feedback maybe it's not what you want to do but if it's going to help the situation help the player help the team then you got to figure out what's best in that situation